Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's so great to see you all here for such an important event. I'm Carol Costello. I'm a Kent State University graduate, a CNN anchor and correspondent. I since retired, but I'm now a journalism professor. I'm incredibly proud to be part of this pilot project that we hope to take on the road nationwide. We want to shine the brightest possible light on the university and its extended community by creating a series of events that highlight the lessons learned on May 4th, 1970. Tonight, a conversation with two survivors of May 4th, Chick Canfora and Tom Grace. Before I introduce them in detail, though, let's take a look back at that time in Kent's history that changed the course of our nation. On Monday morning, May 4th, Kent State students make their way to class as usual. What is not usual is the presence of Ohio National Guardsmen stationed around the campus. The mayor of Kent had called the guard into the area and they first appeared on campus on Saturday night when the ROTC building burned. As soon as you got on campus, everything was different. There's a tank sitting in front of the library. How many people go to class and see a tank sitting in front of their classroom? At 11 a.m., students are heading toward the Commons, the hub of campus, as is typical. But many are going to attend a rally that had been called for three days earlier on May 1st. Some stop. Some move on. Across the Commons at the ROTC site, the number of guardsmen is now 113. General Canterbury, who arrived at the scene in civilian clothing, takes charge. And the order came down to lock and load, fix bayonets, and prepare to use gas. I issued that order to my men. Guard officers have already decided to disperse the rally. It wasn't a feeling of danger or ominous or impending catastrophe. At the rally, students are conscious of their First Amendment rights, freedom of speech, and freedom of assembly. They gather around the Victory Bell to express their opposition to Nixon's expansion of the Vietnam War, and now to something closer to home, the presence of 850 soldiers on their campus. This is my campus. I have a right to be here. I felt like we'd been invaded. Anti-war and anti-guard chants emerge in spurts of protest. I actually stood up on that brick structure and tried to call for a student strike. A jeep circles the space on the commons three times. A police officer tells students to leave the area. Leave this area immediately. Several rocks are thrown in the direction of the jeep. One rock bounces off the jeep's tire. We didn't think that anybody had the right to tell us that we couldn't stand there in a group. There was no riot. Um, th there, there was peaceful protest taking place. Guardsmen launch tear gas from the line at the ROTC site and begin marching toward the protesters. A brisk wind blows cool air across the commons, dispersing much of the gas in the open space. A few protesters pick up canisters and throw them back some in the crowd are affected by the tear gas. Others walk out of its path to avoid it. A tear gas canister landed right at my feet, and I got a big whiff of tear gas and went into one of the nearby dormitories to catch my breath. Halfway across the commons, the guardsmen split into two groups. Company C, with one third of the guardsmen, heads towards the Prentice Hall side of Taylor Hall. They take up positions there blocking re-entry to the commons. Company A and Troop G, comprised of 75 guardsmen and officers, make their way up and over Blanket Hill, dispersing the retreating students. They stop down on the practice field where General Canterbury and Lieutenant Colonel Fassinger assess the situation. Some rocks are thrown at guardsmen. Some guardsmen throw rocks. Around 12.10 p.m., about a dozen guardsmen from Troop G are ordered to kneel and aim their weapons as a show of force at a dozen vocal demonstrators in the parking lot. 
some 150 to 200 feet away. Nobody quite knew what to make of that. Uh, speaking for myself and for Allison, we had no conception that there were bullets in the, those rifles. I was waving a black flag of protest, and I was shouting at the guard. And I saw some of them then begin to kneel and aim in our direction. Uh, fortunately for me, they didn't fire at that moment. Guard officers, including General Canterbury and Lieutenant Colonel Fassinger, confer in a huddle at the far end of the field. Then the guardsmen begin to leave their position on the practice field and move back in the same direction from which they came. To those students observing them, this movement appears to signal a retreat. As they march uphill, members of Troop G look back toward the parking lot. It seemed um, to many people that we had accomplished our purpose of having gone out and demonstrated against their presence. And even though they broke up our demonstration, now they were leaving. The guardsmen suddenly turn in unison and level their guns in the same direction. And at this point, things started changing. It, it's like a film playing in slow motion for me. Guard officers stop the firing. The unit turns and marches back toward the commons. Shock waves of disbelief, anguish, and grief emanate from the students. They are left on their own to care for their classmates who lie dead, dying, and wounded. It, soon it was interrupted by a moan here or a cry there, and then all of a sudden, just like this scream of horror in unison as it finally hit us, they'd shot us. Students begin to move back to the commons to protest the shooting by the guard. When the guard makes clear that protesters must move from the victory bell, students stage a sit-in on a slope along the side of the commons. Guardsmen are positioned above and below the sit-in. Faculty Marshal Glenn Frank intervenes with guard officers to prevent another troop advance. Sir, you've got a couple hundred students there who might get hurt. Are you, are you all Can right? we try to move them out first? Can we try yeah, to move them out? Can we move them out? How long will you give us? Frank then makes an anguished plea to students to convince them that if they do not leave, they will be shot too. Please listen to me right now. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I am begging you right now, if you don't disperse right now, they're going to move in and there can only be a slaughter. Jesus Christ, I don't want to be a part of this. Please, I'm begging you also, follow me out this way. Today, the guardsmen open fire on the students, killing four of them, two young men and two young women. Three were shot in the chest and one in the head. A dozen or more others were wounded, some by gunfire and some by bayonets. The university is closed and all faculty and students have been sent home. The students were protesting the American invasion of Cambodia. Find the cost of free. 
I'd like to further introduce our two panelists. Tom Grace is an ardent anti-war activist. Bullets took off part of his left foot on May 4, 1970. And Chick Ken Fora, an eyewitness and survivor of the Kent State shootings. She was one of the 24 students indicted by the Ohio Grand Jury. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. I'm just curious, I was watching your body language as you're watching that film, mm -hmm. Chick. Your hands were tightly clasped. What was it like? It's never easy to relive it. I know for the young people here, it's like watching history. Uh, for those of us who survived the, the, the massacre here, it, um, it brings back everything. Um, I know anyone who has ever been a, a victim or a survivor of a shooting will have similar pain that will never go away because those sights and sounds are indelible. So it's, it triggers something every time and it's hard to, to make it through. Tom, I know you don't like to talk about yourself and how you felt that day, um, but we're gonna, ask, we're gonna ask you to do that today because I think it's important to know what it was like back then and what that felt like. So as you are watching that, what went through your mind? Well, I've seen the film a number of times and was a consultant for the Visitor Center. So I lived the process for a number of years and I've also um, authored a traditional history uh, about student activism here in the what I call the, the long but, 60s. But, but as you see that and you relive it, what, what's in your heart? Well, um, I internalize it for the most part um, and try to keep, keep it focused on the larger story. But it's important for people to remember that we did not represent a threat to the National Guard despite everything that some of them may have said. And all the photographic evidence, and evidence is very important as James Madison um, um, often would say. But you told me on that day, you're in the hospital after being shot on campus at your college. Right. Which is inconceivable to all of us, right? That's inconceivable that that would happen. You're lying in the hospital and you say, I wasn't really that surprised. Well, I, I really wasn't um, fully aware of the gravity um, and the immensity of it until the next day because I went into surgery in a um, fairly short period of time after getting to the hospital. And it wasn't until probably May 5th that I became aware of the number of people that had been killed. Were you in shock? Um, at that point, no. I, I was still, um, you know, coming out of the anesthesia and, and all. But, um, so you I, wake I, up and, and you're... I, I do remember uh, learning how many pe how, the number of people who had been killed, and I, I remember breaking down and, 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 and crying about that. Um, I knew that some people were, had been killed because I was carried past um, the body of Jeff Miller. I didn't know that was Jeff Miller. I didn't know Jeff Miller at the time. Um, but anyone who's seen the, the awful photographs, I mean, he was shot in the head and there was a tremendous pool of blood. And I was also placed in the same ambulance with Sandy Scheuer, and she had had a neck wound. And I remember looking down at um, her body before they covered her with a sheet, and she was ashen. Um, I mean, she had, she had bled out. Uh, so you knew she was dead in the ambulance? Yeah, I, and I had actually met her, been introduced to her about a week beforehand. That was the only time I had ever met her. She was the only one of the four that I had had any kind of a personal relationship with, um, and I barely recognized her. Um, I, I remember uh, maybe 10 or 15 years a after the shootings wa watching a play in this very room, I think it was called Requiem, and I sat next to Mrs. Scheuer when we watched the play, and that was very, very difficult. I usually don't get emotional about these things, but it was very difficult to sit next to the mother of a young woman who was killed at Kent State and who was in the same ambulance with me and watched that play. Did you talk to her about it at all? I did, I got to, I got to know the, the Scheuers um, f fairly well. They, they, were very, they were brave and courageous people. Their wedding anniversary was on May 4th, if you can believe that. Um, 
And um, as, as Chuck was saying um, earlier, I, I think the immensity of this um, affects you in different ways at different stages of your life. Once you become a parent yourself, you have a newfound appreciation for what was taken away from those four families. So still focusing, because you guys were friends in college, right? Yes. Yes. In fact, there's, there's a photograph of, Ch of Chick and I, the same, we were in the, in the same um, uh, frame of the photograph. It was taken on the common side of, um, of um, or on the um, common side of Taylor Hall. And um, you know, in, in fact, we, she lived in Lake Hall and I was in Johnson. And I was roommates with her brother, Alan. I heard she uh, kind of wrote your papers for you. <laughs> she retyped she retype them. She retyped them, yes. And they, they were we better than what I had submitted. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So, Chick, just going back to that video, because um, when the gunfire was depicted, you were there. Yes. Could you process that at the time? Well, uh, that weekend uh, on Friday, uh, before a group of us had gone down to Ohio State because there wasn't an official action planned uh, for the student strike until Monday and we had heard that there was an action taking place down there. And so we went down there uh, and learned that students at Ohio State had been shot with, was it birdshot or buckshot or something? Birdshot. Birdshot. I don't know the difference, but um, and so that was still fresh in my mind when we came back to Kent. And so when we um, were assembled uh, in the Prentice Hall parking lot and we were looking at the National Guardsmen as they were assembled on the practice football field, uh, it had never occurred to me that they would shoot their weapons at us unless they did something similar to what had happened at Ohio State. Well, let, let me just stop you there because um, I read a lot of articles to prepare for this talk. And I think it was you who said of students today that the thought that the National Guard wouldn't fire real bullets, like how could you think they wouldn't fire real bullets? Like that is even an inconceivable to students today. I still can't believe they would fire real bullets. And at 19, it was unfathomable to me, especially in that particular instance where we weren't doing anything wrong. Um, you know, for decades, people always point to the very brief, very momentary stone throwing incident that happened where students who had assembled in the Prentice lot picked up some of the gravel stones that were in the Dunbar parking lot and threw them in the direction of the guard. The guardsmen, if you look at the photographs, were on about the 50 yard line of the practice football field. I don't know how far you can throw a rock, but it's, it, they fell short. And it was more of a threat to us than the guardsmen because they had steel helmets on and gas masks, and so that stone-throwing incident stopped. Even during that brief relay, it never occurred to me that they would do anything more than what they were doing, throwing tear gas at us and throwing stones back at us. So when you, when you hear the gunshots, do you think, what is that? And you don't realize what it is until you see what happened after? Well, it depends on where you are. I mean, so for me, I saw them leaving after they had assembled on the field and they huddled briefly. Um, when they first aimed their guns, that bothered me. But when I saw them huddle and then start their ascent up the hill, there was an air of triumph. Students were saying, they're leaving, they're going. I mean, there was almost a feeling of triumph that we had resisted their efforts to disperse us and now they were going. So. I saw them turn before I heard a sound. That was surprising enough. Seeing them lift their weapons that, and seeing students start to turn, it's, as you heard. Um, what, what did you do as, as you saw them raise their weapons? I saw puffs of smoke, it seemed, um, before I heard a crack. But you didn't and dive to the ground or My run, first instinct or? was to run far because I thought it was birdshot. And my brother's roommate, Jimmy Riggs, who lived with Tom and Alan, pulled me behind a parked car. And it was at that moment that I realized this was not birdshot. This was live ammunition because 
You could hear the bullets piercing the cars around us. You could hear them thumping in the ground. You could hear them ricocheting past our heads. Sh shattering the windows. Uh, shattering the windows. Everyone was crouching behind the tires because it seemed like the bullets were coming underneath the car. And so all you do in that moment when you realize that it's the sound of gunfire, you comprehend that someone is firing at you. You hear everybody around you scuffling and diving and all that goes with that, as the glass was shattering over us, I will never forget crouching there and staying so tight so that I wouldn't be hit and thinking of how many people were out there in the open. Like, I couldn't imagine what was happening. So when you realize that friends of yours, like Tom, were hit, mm -hmm. you what? Well, when, when something like that happens, and I'm sure that for anybody that has, has experienced um, an unexpected um, gunfire coming in their direction, they, and they manage to survive it, uh, it's, it's an indelible memory what it, how quiet it is right after. Because I do think it takes some time to settle in, like, what was that? What just happened? And it's only through that slow process then that it's very natural to start thinking of the people you're with and to look for them. And so every one of us has our own stories of who we saw first. For me, it was Bill Schroeder. He was three feet behind me and he was lying on his back and I could see blood on his neck and his shoulder. And, and, and I, he seemed dead and his eyes were blue and just kind of glistening in the sun. And, and then to my left, I saw a girl in the Prentice parking lot, and I knew Sandy and ran over, but I didn't recognize her until I saw her picture on television because she was so blue and gray. And I had run to her because I still had wet rags in my hand from the tear gas, and something told me maybe I could help somebody who was wounded. And then it was at that moment that I realized where I'd last left my brother would have put him directly in the line of fire. And so the first two people I saw were dead, and I just started running. And when I saw the body of Jeff Miller right at the foot of the hill where I'd last left my brother, I just thought it was my brother. I mean, that's my slow motion run to that spot. And while I felt relief that it wasn't my brother, I, I still had to comprehend the horror of that image you saw of Jeff Miller, who was lying in a pool of blood. And it was right at that moment that our friend Jeff Hartzler came up behind me and said, Alan and Tom both got hit. Okay, so that moment. I want to take you back before May 4th, 1970, mm -hmm. when you first entered Kent State University. I read the book 13 Seconds, and um, it described students as they were in 1970, and this is how it described them. They were rejecting the rat race lives of their parents and straying from the dollar-oriented suburban values of success. Does that describe either of you? Well, it, it doesn't describe me. I mean, I, I grew up in a, um, a working class neighborhood and um, I wasn't motivated by money. I, was, I came here to study history, not to be part of it. Um, but I was, um, I was a politically engaged person in the sense that I were you radical? No, I was not. I was not radical. Um, although I was raised, um, as was Alan and Chick, by a father who was um, an ardent New Dealer, um, who despised Richard Nixon. So I had, um, I had a, um, a definite political point of view. Um, but it took me a while to um, come to the conclusion that the war in Vietnam was wrong. I, w I was against racism. I understood the class nature of, uh, at a very elementary level, the, very, the class nature of our society. Um, but, but, but when you entered Kent State, I mean, did you consciously say to yourself, I'm going to demonstrate against these things? No, no. Um, Were you happy-go-lucky? Were you just? I, I was, a, I was um, a fairly studious individual. I mean, I went to classes. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I, I I, he still <laughs> I, I, I lived both for the moment but also for the future. Um, even even the, um, the night um, on May 3rd when many people were out demonstrating, I was home studying for my history examination Monday morning. Oh my gosh. 
much. How about you, Chick? What, what <laughs> kind of student were you? Oh, you heard me laughing. I, that is not the description of who I was when I arrived here. Um, I really was pretty much a product of what the 50s and 60s intended for me to be. Um, I was defying the norm of staying home and being a mom and not going to college, which is what my Italian father told me I would never do. Be, and they, he was the same guy that said I would never drive a car <laughs> because my mother didn't and still doesn't. Um, but I came pretty much uh, as I was in high school. I was Chicky the cheerleader. I was going to join every club and try out for cheerleader here and run the rowboat regatta as social chairman of my dorm and be an extension of what I was in high school. And um, that was very hard to do in 1968 because the element that I think you read about was a very progressive group of people who did come uh, a little more aware than some of the rest of us about uh, what was going on in the world and what the war really meant. And they were always somewhere on campus. You couldn't walk past the student center and not see somebody with a bullhorn talking about what was going on in the world. So while I spent the first uh, year and a half throwing away the anti-war leaflets and ignoring them, uh, there came a time when uh, I started to pay attention. You know, I, I'd just like to ask all of you, because when I read that in 13 seconds, I thought, wow, that sounds a lot like some of the students today. They were rejecting the rat race lives of their parents and straying from the dollar-oriented suburban values of success. Would that describe your generation, do you think? Kind of? I see some people nodding their heads. That's what's so intrigued me, because there are parallels to today from students and as they were back in 1970. You're the historian. Well, the war looms so large in our lives, and it went on for so long. Uh, it, there was a great, es a great deal of um, escalation in Vietnam between 1965 and 1970, and of course, um, on April 30th, 1970, President Richard Nixon went on live television and announced the expansion of that war into Cambodia. And that really touched the nerve, not only on this campus, but throughout the United States. Um, because so I, students felt the president lied, lied to them. Not only that, um, the war, I, I really, I, I think when people describe Kent State and the students here as middle class, I really think that that misses the boat. That, that description. Um, when you think about, um, this, this is less true today in, um, here in the 21st century than it was in the 1960s. But in the 1960s, Kent was surrounded by some of the most industrialized cities in the United States. And as many as 50% of the students at Kent State came from those cities. Um, they, they, were, they were industrial working class. Um, and many of them, um, as were Alan and Chick, the first members of their family ever to go to college. Um, so that on one hand, it made them, um, they, they kind of bore the responsibility of their, um, um, of what their parents' wishes were for them. But on, on the other hand, um, it was the working class that fought the war in Vietnam. Yeah, I want to ask you about that because I saw something online. I don't know where you were talking, but you said it makes you angry when people say, how did that ever happen at a place like Kent State? Kent, how did it happen there? Why does that make you? Well, on the day, on the day of the shootings, there were no less than two dozen, and per, per, probably more, students in the crowd who were either Vietnam veterans or they were in the Army Reserve or the Marine Corps Reserve. So you had um, Ohio soldiers shooting into a crowd where they easily could have hit Vietnam veterans. Um, and there's this whole myth about um, spoiled kids who had it made and they were in college and it was just some, some type of a frolic that they really didn't have a stake in all of this. Um, my, one of my roommates, his brother was killed on, on the Cambodian border on April 13th, 1970. I remember waking up in the morning and seeing him sitting there smoking a cigarette because the um, news had just come in um, in mid-April that his brother had died. Um, my girlfriend at the time, her brother had been killed on April 27, 1968. He was in the United States Marine Corps. Um, um, you know, th this, th 
this was felt, this was a felt experience for us. And it wasn't terribly unusual for someone to have had a neighbor or a cousin or mm -hmm. a brother. And in some cases, you had students here who's, um, who had older brothers fighting in Vietnam while they were here on the campus protesting against it. While you had other people who had experienced that war and then come um, to the campus of Kent State University to use the GI Bill, and they became involved in the um, anti-war movement. In so fact, the first demonstration that occurred here on uh, May 1st in opposition to the Cambodian invasion, that was organized by Vietnam veterans, one of whom had won the Silver Star. Oh, jeez. So students were definitely engaged, right, in a way that most people didn't expect. But I think that, um, I don't know, I think that even today some adults think that college students are not engaged when they actually are, that they, they, they um, you know, accuse students of being entitled when they don't feel that way. And, and I guess some of what you said, like Parkland comes to mind, right? Those students, like they are engaged because they care, because it, it affects their lives and they remain engaged. And I know that you worked with Parkland students. Tell us about that and, and how maybe the Parkland students protest parallel or maybe are similar in some ways of the protest back on May 4th. Well, my experience in Parkland was as a um, crisis communications um, expert in just helping them in the aftermath and the media management and also in the messaging. And so um, most of the students that you think of as the activists that then went on, like many of us did in the aftermath of our own tragedy, that went on to teach others about it and became more actively um, engaged. Uh, most of those students were on speaking tours, unlike us in 1970. Most of them had publicists and agents already um, and so forth. We were under a gag order back then uh, because not long after that, we, there were a number of us that were indicted, but we also were sent off of our university campus and it was the end of the school year and we were all very, very separate. So the experiences are, are quite different. The similarities between what the Parkland students and the Kent State students endured um, is that both of us were victims of what I see in a sense as state-sponsored violence. It doesn't matter if it's a young man who, by virtue of his ability to access weapons um, like that, those that he used, or the National Guardsmen making a conscious effort to shoot us, um, there, there was blame there. And we all looked for who might have been able to avoid that happening to us. You know, for us, it was the university and our president who left us, abandoned us, and turned our campus over to the military. For these young Parkland students, it's Congress and, and their state legislature. How can you have laws that let you tolerate tolerate this kind of thing happening and leaving us so vulnerable. So we have the similarity in the vulnerability, but we have the same pain and we have the same PTSD or whatever it is that manifests itself for some people to withdraw and for other people to act out. And so we have an affinity with those activist students. So, so Tom, when you saw the Parkland kids protesting, you saw them on television, you, you saw them being vilified via social media, did you feel a sort of kinship with them, or was it completely different? Well, I remember what it was like to be vilified, mm. um, to be sure. Th then it was um, the comment to your face, or the letter to the editor, or the occasional person that would be interviewed on, on the local news, or if that local news feed went to the national news. Um, today, with social media, it's, uh, it's nonstop ever present and it doesn't make any difference what, what was the, what was the, what the worst thing you heard is. about yourself back then well I was um, I was shielded um, from it um, for the most part because I I was in the hospital for two months so um, I didn't experience too much of it face to face uh, my parents um, had to endure some of that calls to the house um, anonymous letters um, people um, coming up to them in the lobby of Robinson Memorial saying, you know, your kid is no good. Um, he, got, he got what was coming to him, that, that type of thing. But um, I myself didn't experience um, too much of that. Mm -hmm. um, but th the people who, um, 
Let me, let me, let me the answer the question in this way, too. One did not need to be um, shot at Kent State to have been harmed here. Um, just about every Kent student ha had to endure something. Um, all it took was a, um, a Kent State University, university, uh, Kent State university um, decal on the back of your car to get into trouble back in 1970. <laughs> just, um, to be, be pulled over by the police wow. or to have some citizens see that in another state and then uh, assume that you were a communist because you had gone to school at Kent. Um, so th there, were, there were thousands and thousands of people that had to come to terms with that experience. So it's been 50 years, 50. Some might say that's a half century ago. So Chick, why not just let it go? <laughs> I wish it were that easy. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of all of us who have not let it go. Um, it's, it's something you can't let go of. Uh, because you have to process it forever. When I look at the arc of my understanding and my whole, uh, the manner in which I've reflected on it, taught about it, processed it, you know, discussed it with my own children, um, I realize that probably anybody who experiences something like that goes through changes. I know I looked at it differently when I became a mother. And, you know, I, I used to, sit with the families and five years out or 10 years out think they still look so sad you know <laughs> yes they still would be so sad if they were still here and so as a mother i i had a different way of of reflecting on the enormity of that loss and the enormity of the pain that it left behind and the how outrageous it was that Martin and Sarah were on their 25th wedding anniversary driving to Kent to identify their daughter's body for just being on a, on a college campus. Um, having been an activist uh, f to advocate for justice here allowed me to deal with the anger that I had that, you know, contrary to Parkland where the, the school system was very, very careful about how they reacclimated their students back onto the campus, um, sensitively with flowers and therapy dogs and things like that. Like, we had none of that. We had, there was no reacclimation. There was no outreach to us. There was no way to help us process the anger, the pain, the grief that we endured. We were pretty much left on our own to do that. And so, you're right, some, some people, you know, why not let it go? It's hard to let it go because it becomes a full-time job to just get through it and still make something of your life. And I, I, there's many of us who have gone on to defy what Governor Rhodes branded us, the worst type of people you har we harbor in America. You know, that, no, we all went on to do very good things. Indeed, so, so I'm indeed, I was going to say two of the students who were wounded were indicted by the Portage County Grand Jury, including um, <laughs> Joe Lewis. And we know the man who shot him, Larry Schaefer. He wasn't indicted, but Joe was. And he was not only shot once, he was shot twice at, at, at 60 feet. So but in Portage part County, in Portage County, though, yeah. you have to understand that of all the newspapers in the world that had the headlines of what happened here, it was the Kent Record Courier that was the only one that said sniper fires on guard and that two guardsmen were dead. I was just going to read something <laughs> that was written long ago in the Record Courier. After the various investigations were over and no member of the National Guard was indicted for killing four unarmed students, a Record Courier columnist wrote this, quote, we millions of Americans have been called the silent majority. It seems that it's that is if by silent command we are showing love for our country. The sudden surge of patriotism is refreshing. It's good to see old glory flying proudly in front of my home. Mm. That silent majority. We hear that today too, Tom. Is it, is it the same? Is it, was it different? Well, um, well, first of all, in just reading that, your just reaction to someone who would Give a quote like that to the newspaper after four students were killed on campus and you were injured. Well, it's not a surprise to me that that would appear in the Record Courier. Um, I don't think the paper deserves um, th this today, 
but in 1970, we, re we used to refer to it as the wretched courier. Um, they not only um, wrote in 1970 that there was sniper fire, but they also printed in their headline that two guardsmen had been killed at Kent State. So they, they, um, they, they, um, they couldn't have got the story more wrong. Um, so what this, was, this, this was a very difficult area in, in which to be an anti-war activist because the, um, the immediate surroundings were so hostile to what we represented. So what do you suppose this person meant by saying this? The sudden surge of patriotism is refreshing. It's good to see old glory flying proudly in front of my home. Well, in a way, that they were saying that um, they were endorsing what the National Guard had done without coming out in so many words in terms of saying that. But in point and fact, they wrote um, an editorial that appeared on the front page of the paper that called for the sternest possible repression after they learned that four people were dead. So that's fairly mild compared to the front page editorial that, that actually appeared in the paper. It's really unbelievable. So the mystery of why the National Guard troops opened fire indoors. Chick, do you ever think we will know if anyone gave the order to fire or why the National Guard opened fire? Well, we believe there was an order to fire. And I think we have evidence to prove that. Um, but I, I find it difficult to believe that there's not one guardsman um, who might come forward at some point. Um, it, it's, it boggles the mind that for 48 years we've been out here telling the truth. They're not. Um, there were many years where they just had their same self-defense claims and their party line. Uh, but over the years, we've heard here and there that there are some that have pangs of guilt. I, I met somebody recently who said they knew the son of a guardsman who finds it difficult to talk about Kent State um, because it's a sore subject in their family. So I wonder about how their own children and grandchildren process that. But I'd like to believe that, like we saw 50 years after, you know, more than 50 years after it, and Tom will know when the blue and the gray came together at the Battle of Gettysburg and, and embraced each other and, and asked the question, why were, you know, what were we fighting for? Uh, same way, you know, we've, we lost more people in the Civil War than any war we fought, and, you know, we were as divided in 1970 as we were then, and I think as we are now. And so to your point, it's it, the, the one thing that, you know, to that discussion of patriotism flying, Nixon said, well, when dissent turns to violence, it invites tragedy without taking ownership of the fact that he, it was his hateful rhetoric, similar to the rhetoric we're hearing out of our president today, that called campus protesters bums when we were just questioning the policies of our government. It was his vice president that actually challenged um, state highway patrolmen to imagine that we were wearing brown shirts and white sheets. And it was Governor Reagan in California who said, if these students want a bloodbath, let's get it over with. So on those, you know, came Governor Rhodes's rhetoric saying it's over with in Ohio. We're not, we're not going to treat the symptoms. We're going to eradicate the problem. Do you and think, do and you that, uh, that was that rhetoric that led, I believe, to the actions of the Ohio National Guard who were conditioned to see us as enemies. And these soldiers were conditioned to be seen as patriots. Do you think our country's as divided now as it was then, Tom? In some, respect, in some respects, I do. Um, now, as, as in 1970, um, people could be shot down by the police and not have to bear any consequences from that. There's about 1,000 people every year killed by the police. Um, maybe six of, of, of that number would be actually prosecuted, and maybe two would be convicted out of 1,000 dead. So does that mean we learned nothing from the events of 1970? No, I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. Um, just as we um, will often hear people say, well, we don't want another Vietnam. 
We'll also hear people say we don't want another Kent State. So there has been um, some degree of awareness that um, if, you, if you're going to engage in repressive tactics, that you can't have wanton shooting on a college campus against demonstrators. But um, it's still far too easy in this country for uniformed authorities to kill people, whether they're wearing ar um, army green or um, police blue, and, um, and not be held accountable for it. What do you think we've learned from May 4th, 1970, Chick? Well, um, here at Kent State, I think we've learned to reconcile and heal um, in the only way we knew how to do on our own. Um, over the years, we've had a, a good deal of um, student support in keeping the memory alive so that we can continue to learn the right lessons from this, and that is we do have the constitutional right to disagree with our government. We do have a right to assemble peacefully. We should never have been shot down for that. And we've always believed that it was very, very important that students forever here and elsewhere know and understand that precious right and also understand the role that college students have historically played to serve as the conscience of America, to come to this place, this very, very, very special place called the university where this is where you figure it out. This is where you leave that comfortable bubble that I left in Barberton when I came here just to be a cheerleader and a teacher. And instead, I became an anti-war activist. You know, th that's not a job, that's not a career, that is something that I had no choice but to be because I didn't want to see my brother die the way my friends were dying. That is a metamorphosis of awareness that only can take place in an environment like this. And today's college students don't have the freedom or the time that we had in 1970 in 1968 when my college tuition was $197 a quarter. My room and board in Lake Hall was $450 a year. You could work a minimum wage job and pay, for your, pay your way through college. Today's students are, I believe intentionally, strapped with tuition debt, strapped with credit card debt, because it's a lot easier to control people if they don't have time to pay attention to what's going on. You think that's on. intentional? Well, I think it's intentional as a good example that we don't have a free, a free media anymore. We've lost the fairness doctrine. We have state-run TV. Um, in, in many cases, we've had media deregulation so that you don't see so much of what's going on in the world, but they can package news for you. In the same way, I do believe that college students are not afforded the opportunity to think and to dream and to not be strapped with debt when they leave. You know, I have to stand up for CNN. <laughs> we try our best. We I do. wasn't talking about CNN. I know. <laughs> I know. I know that some of you uh, wrote out some questions on some um, cards. Do we have those yet? Because I want to get to your questions as well. I can't see my people. They're coming. Okay. Um, lessons learned. Well, it's often said that repression works, and I will um, concede that it often does, but sometimes it doesn't. And here at Kent State, it didn't, because people, when they came back to school here in the fall of 1970, and this was after the largest um, emergency protest in American history within six days of the Kent State shootings in Washington, and the largest student strike, that students, um, resume their anti-war activities. And this place was in constant motion for about two or three years. And the war and the protest against the war in Vietnam and its expansion into countries such as Cambodia and Laos in 1971 went on here as long as did the Vietnam War. So at Kent State, at any rate, repression did not work because the students said, we are not going to allow this to silence us, and we didn't. That's awesome. Okay, this question is from Alex Gardner. How should the students of today carry on the memory of the May 4th victims? Sure. Well, I think you should use what we've done over the last 48 years as a model, but you also have some, you know, a wind at your back that we didn't have for many of those years. Um, you heard me talk about 
one of one of our lessons here is learning not only to heal but to reconcile and the reconciliation is not with the guardsmen who shot us but with the university that we felt had abandoned us for many years uh, five years after um, we had our uh, president glenn old said five years is long enough to remember and said we're not going to have commemorations anymore and thanks to the uh, student run may 4th task force um, students said, no, we will remember. There are lessons. Um, ten years in, the President Brage Golding said ten years was long enough to wear a hair shirt, as if we were just an irritant, we were just a nuisance. You know, so in, in 1977, they, they, they built a gymnasium on the site of the shootings, and at one year they even changed the name so it didn't even sound like Kent State. It was going to be Kent. And so that... The, the, you know, that adds injury to a pain that's already there. And it's really been in the last three tenures, uh, presidential tenures, starting with Dr. Carol Cartwright, can, and then proceeding with uh, Lester Lefton, and now with your current university president, uh, Beverly Warren, that we've managed to not just continue the commemorations and to see a university presence there, but we've also been able to have the May 4th Visitor Center, the walking tour, the uh, the the, uh, the markers where our, where our friends uh, died, and um, now you know national historic landmark status and others. It, those things are huge. Those are the things we fought for so long. But the one thing that's different for today's students is you have the university there with you, and it's you have greater capacity, and and so I. I'd say that my turning point was in August when, when Tom Grace and I um, joined John Cleary, another wounded student at Chautauqua, to hear uh, Beverly Warren give a speech there. And for me, it was the most healing moment because it was the first time I'd really heard a university president say, we own this, we did this, this was not done right, this was not done well. And yeah, it, was, um, it was a remarkable speech. It, I mean, we were just, it, it was stunning for us. It was, a, it was a game changer for me. And so I'm looking at some of the students here nodding because they've heard me say this before, that um, we have a very short window of opportunity under her incredible leadership to really define what that looks like going forward for future generations of students, where I think it has to have the, the same components that the task force had. You need to educate about May 4th. You need to commemorate May 4th but you also need to be active and engaged and find a way for May 4th to be the place where it's not just on May 4th you talk about the issues of the day, but your curriculum reflects it, your campus life reflects it, the kind of honest debate and, and d d democratic participation that we enjoyed in 1970 should be routine here because Kent State can model for other universities where this can happen where you are protected and you are safe to do so. This question is from uh, David Brigette. I'm a journalism student here at Kent State. My sophomore year, I tried digging into a story based on the National Guardsman perspective. Needless to say, I hit a roadblock and um, none of them would speak to me, of course. <laughs> yes, of course, in parentheses. My question is this, if you had the chance to sit down and speak to the National Guardsman, what would you say and why? Tom. Well, I'd, I'd ask them um, what happened and who gave the order and what went on in Will's gym where they all met afterwards and got their story together because they've never come clean with that. But I would like to expand on this question and by going back to one, Carol, that you asked earlier. Um, there was an order to fire on, on May 4th. You could hear it on an audio tape that Chick's brother, Alan, discovered um, at Sterling Library at Yale University in um, 2006 and announced it, um, and some of this was on CNN. Um, I on, covered it. On, on May 1st, um, 2007. And all of the evidence points, uh, although it's not conclusive, but all of the evidence points to a major by the name of Harry Jones standing underneath the pagoda giving that order. One of the guardsmen who's um, interviewed in the film, Matthew McManus, he's the only guardsman that admits giving or an order to fire. He did order his men to, um, to fire. He said to fire one or two rounds over their heads. There's seven guardsmen that acknowledged having heard an order to fire. Um, so we have both the um, audio evidence and we also have um, 
the uh, um, evidence that came forth from their after action reports and their interviews with the FBI and later with the Ohio Highway Patrol. So um, to me, what took place on May 4th was not all that mysterious. I mean, if someone wants to really dig deep into the evidence, it's, it's all there. Um, but um, for some but, but if the evidence is all there, then why isn't it out? It's so bizarre, right? It's puzzling. It, it is, and it's, this is um, too long to go into, but the Justice Department had an opportunity um, around 2010, 2011 to reopen this. And um, the Assistant Attorney General of the United States, Thomas Perez, had an opportunity to interview some of the forensic sound analysts who came to the same conclusion that Alan Kent Ford did, that there was an order to fire. He never bothered to interview either one of those men and, um, and, and um, announced that there would be no reopening of the, of the investigation. And that was now, a huge disappointment to us. Now, now he probably would say, the, the evidence just wasn't conclusive and we can't go forward. We um, well, I've had the opportunity as recently as last October to try to speak with Thomas Perez. Um, and when I started to raise the issue to him, he turned around and walked away from me. You look angry. I was very angry. You I was look very angry, angry now. I, I, was, I was angry then I, um, and I remain angry about that. And um, he, he's the head of the Democratic National Committee. But, but why wouldn't he talk with you? Like, what? it's been 50 years. Carol, I hope you have the opportunity to interview him someday and ask him that question. <laughs> I, would, I, I would love to hear his response. Or our young journalism student, that'd be awesome. This is from Megan Bilo. How do you think perceptions of May 4th have changed over the years? Have they changed? Sure, if you don't mind, I'll-, I'll, I'll Go ahead. Um, the first, um, and perhaps only public opinion poll was the Harris poll, um, taken probably a week after the shootings. And over 60, I think it was 61 percent of the American public sided with the National Guard. Um, usually when people are confronted with um, change or a shocking situation that they poorly understand, they kind of fall back on, on what they know. And it wasn't all that surprising to me that the majority um, of the American people sided with the National Guard over the students. But over a period of time, I think, um, and there's never been a subsequent poll, but my sense is, is that people who, of course, most of those people are not, have gone on, but um, if one were to take the same poll today, I, I, don't, I, I think it would be more um, in our favor that, they, that um, people um, feel that what was done here was a great wrong. And in much, in much, it would reflect the same kind of change that has occurred here at Kent State. For the first 25 years, um, the presidents of Kent State University tried to uh, not only control the, the pre that present, but they also tried to control the past or, e or even erase it as they did with yes, the- Yes, they wanted to pretend it didn't happen. Right, with the, with the gymnasium. But I think since President Cartwright and, and then with President Lefton and now today with President Warren, they also realized that they can control the future. And this is a university after all, and we have to educate people about what took place here. And I think Kent State University has done a marvelous job over the last three presidential administrations in terms of coming to terms with it. And I think they deserve a great deal of credit. Um, my final question, um, I've lived all over the country. And whenever I say that I went to Kent State University, mm -hmm. everyone says, where the four students died? Do you think that will ever change? Well, it used to be, were you there when they had the riots? You know, to which I have to say, it was a peaceful demonstration. Um, and I think, you know, to what Tom just said, you, you know what you know. Uh, my son's eighth grade Ohio history book had a picture of the guardsman, which you saw on the screen with the trigger men in the midst of firing for 13 very long seconds. And the caption read, um, during the Vietnam War, um, many students across America uh, rose up in protest. Here at Kent State, the protests got out of hand. Uh, students threw rocks at the Ohio National Guard. The National Guard, fearing for their lives, opened fire, killing four and wounding nine. 
um, I, I was appalled that the history book was teaching this to students. Um, of course, it was one of the things that reinforced what we were doing to educate people was right. And so to Tom's point, um, more recently with the past administrations and the opening of the visitor center, uh, the showing of Fire in the Heartland to freshman experience, um, the opportunities that we have to come to the visitor center and talk with students and to the May 4th class and in forums like this, give us a chance for students at Kent State to know and understand their history because they will be, like the three of us, asked, what do you know? What happened there? And you have a responsibility, I think, if you are a Kent State student, to know your history and to tell the truth of what happened here. And I think that, that responsibility goes beyond, and, and I'm, I'm very confident that this current administration recognizes the role going forward to not only uh, teach the lessons that we have learned over the last 48 years, but to model for other university campuses the way it should be, how we um, encourage and foster uh, dissent, um, peaceful dissent, and how we protect it. Thank you both very much. Chick Canfora, Thomas Grace, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. for coming. And this concludes our event. This concludes our event. <laughs> you guys are so a, polite. Do, have a burning, do any of you have a burning come question? Up, yes, come up and ask. Before you leave, you have a burning question? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Tessa Polane. Um, You're what? Tessa Polane. Hi. I'm photo editor for The Burr. I talk with uh, your brother, Alan both of you um, about this and I was just wondering um, before May 4th from 67 to 69 President White and uh, Dr. Barclay D. McMillan were cracking down on, on protesters um, how so like in, in what ways were they um, <coughs> intrusive well I mean we can talk about Sack and um, well, I'll um, defer to the historian here because there were quite a number of ways that they really tried to quell student protest on campus. The question, the question oh. was um, about uh, President Robert White, who was the president in 1970, and the manner in which the university administration between the period of 1967 and 1969 had tried to stop student protests or to uh, be very oppressive in um, their tactics to uh, uh, stifle dissent? Well, they used undercover agents, for one thing. Um, that emerged full-blown in 1972, actually, um, two years after the shootings. Um, but there was a widespread use of um, undercover agents here. Um, and threats, um, that sometimes were carried out to arrest students if they participated in demonstrations. Um, in mid-November of 1968, the Oakland police uh, came here to recruit, and on the same April day that Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis, there was a black member of the Black Panther Party um, who was 17 years of age who was shot in the back by the Oakland police. So it really created a firestorm here when that same police force came here to recruit students at Kent State. And um, members of the Students for a Democratic Society that I was affiliated with, as was um, Chick's brother, Alan, and Bla the Black United students sat in um, in what was then known as the Student Activity Center. It connected, um, it no longer is there, but it connected um, Johnson and Stouffer Halls at the time and blocked the Oakland police from being able to recruit. And the university was prepared to uh, uh, um, have a lot of the students who participated arrested. And the Black United students said, if you, um, unless you give us amnesty, we're all going to leave, leave the campus. And um, the university said, no, we're not gonna grant a amnesty. So at the time, there were about 600 African-American students here. And I would say somewhere between 550 and maybe 575 left the campus until um, they were assured that there would be amnesty for all the people who participated. Um, the following spring in 1969, 
um, some of us um, went into music and speech to try to attend hearings of some students that had been arrested about a week or two um, beforehand. And the university said, no, these are closed. And we went in to listen to those um, hearings. And, um, and the university called um, Portage County um, deputy sheriffs. They came onto the campus and blocked the entranceways to um, the third floor of music and speech and then had everybody up there arrested. And it was the, those repressive tactics that for, I can say, speak for myself to say, um, I can't think of a moment that inspired me more than seeing every black student on campus walk out and then seeing the impact that it had and knowing that students could make a difference was empowering to me. I mean, I, I, I'd never seen anything like that. And uh, the music and speech uh, demonstration was my first demonstration where I was trapped in the building and, uh, and didn't realize um, that um, you know, they would take those kinds of tactics. And it, it mobilized us. It radicalized us in many ways. And so those repressive tactics just don't work. As a woman, um, what was your role and women on campuses, if that makes sense? I don't know if I'm running that right. Their role in well, Candy Knox was one of my inspirations. So was Bernadine Doran. I, I was I was inspired by strong women who that were just smarter than I was, and they were smarter than a lot of the guys on campus. The guys seemed to have the bullhorn all the time, but I learned a lot from the women activists and and. Um, you know, it was, it was a time when women were really, um, they called it women's lib back then, but w women were finding their voice. And, uh, and they, they certainly played a part in my own awareness and my um, own uh, motivation to become active. Any other questions? Good. Hi, Robin Van Zandt, faculty member. Thank you for, for being so articulate and explaining this to us. It's just um, hard to believe. But I, Chick, you mentioned something about a comparison from then politically to some of what's going on now. Mm -hmm. And of course, we hope to learn from history. So would you, both of you, have any suggestions on what to kind of watch for, how to kind of proceed through some of what's going on today so that we don't get in the same kind of situation? Well, I, I do want to mention some. Um, Danny Miller has this film called Fire in the Heartline, and it was only when I saw Bob Pickett interviewed in that film that I finally understood where our, our friends who were in the Black United Students were on May 4th. Like, we were there, or as Tom described, um, when they had their action. Uh, but they were not d with us on May 4th. But that's because they understood something we didn't understand. You know, they understood state-sponsored violence. <laughs> They knew they could get shot for being out there. And they were probably wise because they might have been the first shot. Um, and that's why Bob Pickett says in that film, we told our people to stand down. Uh, but you know, when I look at Black Lives Matter today and I look at the students at Parkland and whatever, we have not come so very far. You know, as we, we are as racist as I ever remember thinking we were in 1968. It's just more overt right now because Trump has made it okay. Um, and, and it worries me a great deal, the kind of hateful rhetoric that is becoming just so, and we're numb to it. It doesn't shock us anymore. Uh, and, and that's really where America had become by the time Nixon and Agnew and Reagan and Rhodes demonized us and called us such terrible names that people basically just saw us as thugs and hooligans and the National Guard just saw us as having targets on our backs. So, so if there's the same kind of language going on mm. at the upper echelons of our government, I mean, is it, you know, it became so violent in our country back then, right, because of that rhetoric. Could it become violent today because of that same kind of rhetoric? It is. <laughs> I, I think absolutely. Um, to, to me, having a man like Donald Trump in the White House is roughly the equivalent to have had, having George Wallace in the White House in, um, in 1969. Well, you don't have shootings at the synagogue, and you don't have Charlottesville. And, and so much acceptance of those things because 
How quickly do we move on from things that should be just as outrageous to us as May 4th is? Like, we're not moving on. Like, America should not move on when these things continue to happen. They're still happening. Do, what do what you, you saw on that become, screen is happening. So, in a sense, have Americans become numb to that kind of rhetoric, and that's why we don't see these huge protests that we did back in the 60s and early 70s. Hmm. Well, actually, the largest protest uh, occurred on the day after Donald Trump was in, uh, inaugurated. The Women's March. Right. right. Mm -hmm. That was probably the largest protest in American history. And I think we reaped the dividends of that this past November. With, uh, particularly with so many um, women being elected to higher office. And that's one of the things that, that does tie 1970 to the present, because in 1970, the voting age was 21. So you could be sent to Vietnam to fight and die, but you couldn't vote to um, have any control over those policies. But by June of 1970, the United States Congress both houses had passed legislation lowering the voting age to 18. And by May of 1971, that had been ratified by three-fourths of the states, um, incorporating that language into the, uh, became the 26th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Um, it's, it's easy to pick on um, the um, current generation of students. People do it too much, and I think it's uncalled for. But I can remember um, what this campus was like in 2004, and I can remember what this campus was like in um, 2012 during the presidential years, and uh, students were lined up 100, 150 deep to vote around here. This was a very engaged campus, and I hope that all of you are um, um, registered to vote. And those few of you in the audience who are not, I hope you'll take full advantage of that, because one of the things that um, um, was very different about the 1960s and early 1970s from, um, from today. It was very difficult back then uh, not only to vote, uh, because you had to be 21, most college students could not, but if you were to vote, you either had to vote by absentee ballot or you would have had to re return to your homes. So if you were from Canton, you would have had to have driven down to Canton that day to vote if you were living in Kent. Now you can register here in your own community. So there's no, there's no reason why a student cannot um, register your opinion to, to vote. And if anyone has a stake in this society, it's young people because of the terrible climate situation that you're inheriting, plus the enormous student debt. And I can assure you that if students were um, engaged in higher numbers and had a much higher turnout, um, the people who hold elected office would be, be paying far more attention to your issues than they are today. So you really have a, a, norm, or a wonderful opportunity here to make, to make a difference. And this doesn't mean that that's the only form of political activity, but it's probably the easiest. All you have to do is fill out a uh, piece of paper and, and go down and, and vote, and also remember to vote in the off-year elections. <laughs> Not, not just the presidential years. So hopefully with that, you'll take, right. you'll take Tom's advice. Thank you both again for, for being here and for sharing your stories. We so appreciate it. Well, thank you for all your questions. It was a nice audience. And thanks to all of you. Thank you for coming.